All right, welcome to lecture 10 from Introduction to Meteorology on Thunderstorms and Severe Weather. Uh, the picture here from the book, a very typical supercell thunderstorm, very likely producing damaging winds, small hail, possibly even large hail, or maybe even a tornado. Very typical, uh, what we refer to as a low precipitation supercell thunderstorm. So let's talk about thunderstorms and what is a thunderstorm and what's the difference between just normal rain and a thunderstorm. So uh, any cloud producing precipitation, and it can be snow as well, but typically we're talking liquid precipitation. Any cloud producing precipitation that within the cloud or emanating from the cloud, there is lightning, and if there's lightning, then there will be thunder. That is a thunderstorm. And a thunderstorm can be made up of one single cumulus cloud, or it can be a cluster of many cumulus clouds, a multi-cell thunderstorms. Thunderstorms are convective, meaning there is an updraft and there is a downdraft. The updraft feeding hot and, well, hot, maybe more moist air into the storm, and the downdraft where the rain is bringing cool and dry air down. So thunderstorms are convective storms that form in rising air, often in conditionally unstable environments. Those environments that you have stability in the low levels where you have to force a parcel to rise, but once it gets to a point where it's reached its saturation and condensation is occurring, the release of heat from condensation, the release of latent heat, causes the parcel to continue to rise all on its own. Uh, it reaches the lifted uh, the level of free convection. Uh, then we have uh, a, a convective thunderstorm. So what are the mechanisms to initially get that parcel to rise in that stable environment? Because again, conditionally unstable means stable at the low levels and unstable aloft. The mechanisms are very similar to the typical mechanisms to get uh, air to rise. Uh, turbulent eddies, meaning winds that swirl around objects, can create turbulent eddies that can force air to rise. Uh, we see that with uh, uh, some types of land-based uh, systems that develop, like well, water spouts and uh, gust nados. Unequal heating on the Earth's surface, it can be uh, as much as a hot, uh, hot area of asphalt, large area of asphalt, creating an updraft, or maybe the urban heat island effect of the entire city. Some cases, if we have a lot of cloud cover in the morning, uh, but in another area it's full of sunshine, where the cloud cover holds temperatures down, temp uh, air will sink there, and where the, there was no cloud cover and the sun heated the land up, air will rise there, and that, that differential heating, that unequal heating will create lift. Um, we have the effect of lift up over terrain or orographic lift. We have convergence along boundaries, whether they're cold fronts, warm fronts, or maybe even uh, sea breeze fronts. We have upper level support. That upper level support can be divergence aloft, wind spreading apart aloft, or sometimes it's just cold air coming in aloft. Um, warm, moist air rising over frontal surfaces, and then also uh, moving up over mountains and terrain, as we said. Generally, there are two types of thunderstorms, a single cell or a single cumulus cloud, known as a, an ordinary cell thunderstorm, and then there's storms that comprise multiple cells or multiple cumulus clouds, and those are multi-cell thunderstorms. So an ordinary cell thunderstorm, sometimes called an air mass thunderstorm because they form in those warm, moist air masses that are conditionally unstable. Um, not necessarily uh, the ordinary cell thunderstorm, not necessarily associated with fronts or any type of severe weather. Many of the thunderstorms that pop up uh, during our warm season over the central peninsula or would be those ordinary cell thunderstorms, typically short-lived uh, with a single, single cumulonimbus cloud and rarely do they become severe. Now, the multi-cell uh, complex or multi-cell thunderstorm, most, uh, most frequently we see those. They contain a number of cells at different stages of development and they form in those regions of moderate to strong vertical wind shear. So an ordinary cell thunderstorm, you're not going to have the wind shear. Once you get wind shear, winds changing with speed or height through uh, the uh, vertical profile of the atmosphere, that's when you're going to start to see multi-cell thunderstorms and they are made up of clusters of cumulonimbus clouds and they can last much longer than air mass storms and oftentimes they do become severe. If the storm is able to become strong enough, a powerful enough updraft, any storm, whether it be an ordinary cell or a multi-cell thunderstorm, can become a severe thunderstorm. A severe thunderstorm is simply, uh, again, a human construct, something we've defined. The term severe thunderstorm refers to a thunderstorm producing hail that's at least a quarter size, the size of a, a quarter, the, the coin, so an inch in diameter or larger, or has wind gusts of 58 miles per hour or greater, and or it's producing a tornado. So any one of those three 
would make it a severe thunderstorm. So this is just how we define the difference between what could be a strong thunderstorm in the afternoon and a severe thunderstorm. So it really is about record keeping and whether we issue warnings or not. Now, lightning can be deadly, obviously, but the National Weather Service does not use it to define a severe thunderstorm. If it did, every thunderstorm would be severe by definition. There are levels in which they issue excessive lightning warnings, 12 strikes per minute. Uh, and there's also excessive rainfall and deadly flash flooding, but also heavy rain is not a severe weather criteria. The distribution of thunderstorms across North America, pretty straightforward. You're going to look for that combination of warmth and moisture, putting the highest distribution of storms uh, smack dab in the Florida Peninsula from central to south Florida, uh, and much fewer out in the Intermountain region and the drier regions of the country. You'll notice the, the maxima there around Lake Okeechobee. As we talk about shallow boundaries initiating thunderstorms, our uh, Seabreeze boundaries are big on that. That's why we get a lot of storms in central Florida. But uh, Okeechobee can also produce lake breeze boundaries. So the combination of lake breezes and sea breezes over south Florida really providing them with uh, quite a bit more thunderstorm activity on an annual basis. The life cycle of an ordinary cell thunderstorm or an air mass thunderstorm, any of those uh, multiple triggering mechanisms occurs. We get some unequal heating. Uh, we get some uplift over some terrain or a little, uh, a little micro gust or, or swirl or eddy. Uh, at, at any rate, we get some uplift, uplift going. Uh, warm, moist air is uh, forced to rise. It cools until it reaches its dew point, at which it's at 100% relative humidity and saturation. Further lifting creates condensation and cloud formation, condensation being a warming process, uh, aiding the parcel into uh, rising on its own. So it's now uh, past the level of free convection. And the growth stage, as warm, humid parcel of air rises, it expands and cools, condensing into a cumulus cloud or a cluster of cumulus clouds. Um, as dry air begins to be pulled into uh, that, uh, that cumulus cloud, that's when we move into the mature stage. That dry air is entrained and falls, uh, and the downdraft begins. And with that downdraft comes the rain. Um, when you have the downdraft and the updraft, it constitutes a cell because you have up and down motion in, this, in the storm. Uh, and gust fronts, those uh, cold air that's spreading out from the surface, begins to choke off the inflow and the updraft. And then once the gust front completely cuts off the inflow and weakens the updraft. There's nothing but downdrafts dominating the storm, uh, which is then mostly rain. Uh, other storms may form along those gust fronts, but that whole cycle took us about 60 minutes to occur. So this animation is what it looks like with the updraft eventually turning into the downdraft where you have the rainfall and that downdraft bringing cold air down that cuts off the inflow, the fuel for the shower and the thunderstorm and eventually the storm itself begins to dissipate and die out. That is an air mass thunderstorm, an ordinary cell thunderstorm. And here is a nice photograph of an ordinary cell thunderstorm somewhere out of the plains. And you can see just one cumulus cloud with a massive growth vertically. We get that very distinctive amble top uh, on the upper levels and a heavy rain down there at the surface. But uh, it's not a multi-cell, it's not in a cluster. Uh, and this particular uh, thunderstorm all by itself. It, it could become strong enough to reach severe levels, but most likely it will rain itself out within that 60-minute uh, time frame. The second type of thunderstorm is our multi-cell thunderstorm. This is the most common type of thunderstorms. Uh, they develop in areas of strong, moderate really, to strong vertical wind shear. And again, wind shear is going to be a change in wind direction or speed with height. And so in the low levels of the atmosphere at the surface, our winds are blowing in one direction or at one speed. And as you go up in the atmosphere, uh, those wind speeds increase. And in this illustration, our winds are coming from the left to the right. Uh, and, uh, and what that does is that allows the updraft to be tilted. So the downdraft that occurs and the rainfall uh, happens away from the updraft. And even though gust fronts spread out, uh, they do not necessarily spread out far enough because the storm is moving along and the updraft is tilted that it can cut off the inflow. So a UDI under that storm uh, represents the updraft in this particular storm and the downdraft where the rain is. And again, you can see little fronts moving out at the surface and that front uh, may help to initiate new storms, but it's not going to necessarily cut off 
the updraft. So our multi-cell storm, the mature cell right there in the middle, the dissipating cell, and then developing cells and new towers uh, along the backside of it where we have the updraft and where the updraft has not been cut off. And that's how you get your multi-cell thunderstorm. And a nice view of uh, multi-cell thunderstorms. In this situation, our storms are actually moving along in the opposite direction uh, where we have the, uh, the cell in the cumulus stage uh, to the far right. So that's, the, that's the, the growth stage. The mature stage, again, right there in the center. And the dissipating stage is to the left. The storms are moving along uh, from, uh, from right to left. And the inflow, the updraft, is occurring on the right side of it. So that updraft's not being cut off and new cells develop. And this is what we typically see uh, in central Florida when we get big clusters of thunderstorms occurring is these, uh, this type of multi-cell storm development. This is a little closer look at the concept of shear on the upper right illustration. Not only do we have directional shear, but we also have speed shear where our surface winds are from the southeast. Our uh, low to mid-level winds are from the southwest. And that, uh, that blue little net structure with the blue line at the surface is indicating that those, those mid-level winds are going to uh, move into the storm and then be pushed down to the uh, surface and spread out as gust fronts. And then those upper-level winds with a little jet streak right there in the middle uh, providing upper-level support. So we have directional shear and we have speed shear. So air mass thunderstorms, they develop in low shear environments. Nothing tilts them. They just go straight up and then rain themselves out straight down. Shear is that change in wind speed or direction, or both, with height. When there's an unstable environment, or a conditionally unstable environment, warm, moist air, with wind shear, precipitation in the downdraft can occur downwind of the updraft, and therefore you do not choke off the storm's inflow, and that allows for much longer-lasting multi-cell storms. And oftentimes, these storms, because those updrafts are, uh, are perpetuated and, and they continue to have inflow from the surface, uh, those thunderstorms become strong enough, strong enough updrafts that you actually get severe thunderstorms. And the illustration on the bottom right, again, uh, we can see the winds from the southeast are fairly weak, and you start getting into those uh, mid-level winds. They're intensifying, and those upper-level winds are much stronger. Upper-level winds tilting that updraft in the vertical, so uh, the downdraft and the rainfall is well out ahead of the updraft and the surface heating. And as that storm moves along, it's going to continue to have that updraft coming in from the southwest, southeast, that is, and that's going to continue to feed that storm, and you'll get multiple cells growing along this particular complex. Here is an overall view of a multi-cell thunderstorm giving you all the different components and winds that are happening. Uh, if you look closely at the illustration, you have one a mature thunderstorm with an anvil top and an overshooting top. Um, and, uh, and to its right, you have new cells. So in, in this situation, um, the, the, uh, the inflow is coming in from the right side of it and the updraft is tilted and the downdraft is off to the left and it's not cutting off that updraft. Actually, it's even helping to create uh, new cells out ahead of it. So the air motions and the different features associated with what would be an intense multi-cell storm. I say it's intense because it's got that overshooting top. That anvil top represents the top of the atmosphere, the tropopause. This updraft is strong enough that it punches through the tropopause into the stratosphere, creating that overshooting top. Um, and then we have cold downdrafts. Again, you see the wind shear. At the surface, the winds are coming in from one direction. As you go up with height, they turn to the opposite direction, uh, and they, uh, they change dramatically. They increase the speed, and you can see that on the left showing the wind, um, and that, uh, that inflow at the mid-levels creates those very cold downdrafts. 